Hello and welcome to the Swiss Connection. I'm Susan Masika. Most people in Switzerland would support a ban on lethal autonomous weapon systems. For example, drones that can shoot people. A poll commissioned by the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots showed that 72% of Swiss respondents would favor a ban, a similar result to several other European nations that were surveyed. In this episode of our Inside Geneva series, correspondent Imogen Folks and analyst Daniel Warner discuss the legal and ethical aspects of killer robots with members of Human Rights Watch and Pax for Peace. Here's Imogen. Hello and welcome to Inside Geneva. I'm Imogen Folks, and with me, as ever, is our expert analyst, Daniel Warner of the Graduate Institute. Our subject today, one that's been discussed here at the UN for many years, lethal autonomous weapons. I think nobody quite knows what they are, but there are a number of groups trying to limit their use or at least define the parameters under which they might be used. I'm joined by Mary Wareham of Human Rights Watch and Frank Slipers of the Dutch peace organisation PAX. Now, to give you a little flavour, a couple of years ago, an artificial intelligence company produced a video showing what lethal autonomous weapons, sometimes called killer robots, might actually be like. Here's a little snippet of it. Just like any mobile device these days, it has cameras and sensors, and just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. Let's watch the weapons make the decisions. This is how it works. They flew in from everywhere that attacked just one side of the aisle. So that video, you might not be surprised to learn, is actually called Slaughterbots. Swarms of little drones flying around, killing people. I have to confess, it scared the life out of me, but I also thought, oh, come on, this is like really sci-fi, futuristic. Mary, you first, and then you, Frank, you say it's not. For the campaign to stop killer robots, which I coordinate, this is an incredibly serious subject. We're trying to prevent uh, the loss of meaningful human control in warfare. Uh, we're trying to retain it uh, going forward. And we see many investments that are happening today into autonomous weapon systems, but that's just the beginning of what could be a very dark path. Uh, so six months after we launched the campaign, nations began to discuss this topic here at the United Nations in 2013. So, but Frank, what we saw, okay, the listeners can't see it, but the, the concept of swarms of things that look like, you know, small birds, but vicious, flying around shooting people. Is this, is this a possibility? Oh, yes, very much. And, and actually, I had uh, more than one friend who, uh, when, when seeing this, uh, this video on YouTube, actually took quite a while until they realized that this was science fiction. I mean, the video, and, and you have to, to watch it, uh, starts a bit as a TED talk and where someone demonstrates uh, a drone that can attack a person. And, I mean, the further the video goes, the more science fiction it maybe gets. But it also shows how something looking very realistically isn't that far away from what we're uh, knowing as, as warfare currently today. Danny, you've got a question, I think, specifically about control. Well, I'm thinking about what does it mean to have human control? I was thinking, Imogen, about the image of the birds. I was thinking of Alfred Hitchcock. No one was controlling the birds either. Why is it so important to have human control? Uh, is it to decide who gets killed or is it the actual killing itself? I think it is both. That's why the campaign to stop killer robots is uh, calling for a prohibition on fully autonomous mm -hmm. weapons. But we're very much focused on what uh, the Red Cross has called the critical functions of weapon systems, which is the selection and identification of a target and then the use of force against it, lethal or otherwise. Those are the two critical functions that we want to see remain under meaningful human control going forward. It's a, in essence the status quo. It's what we have right now and we're asking why do we have to move forward uh, and, and, and uh, create fully autonomous weapons. But isn't it true that 
there is an advantage to having a weapon that can only target an individual or a group of individuals that they want to hit. There's no collateral damage. This is what the military says. In atomic bombs, you have tremendous, and other kinds of weapons, you have tremendous collateral damage. We have many... Well, not many, actually. We hear Israel, the United States, and sometimes Russia talking about how there might be potential benefits or advantages uh, to using these weapon systems. But if you look at the whole catalog of legal, ethical, moral, technical, operational proliferation security concerns, which the governments have been debating over the last five years, you realize that this is not just a weapon system, but it's a whole new way of warfare. And we want to put not the limit on there, but we want to create the framework that's going to prevent the worst kinds of autonomous weapons from being used. Frank, your organisation has produced a couple of reports on this, one called Don't Be Evil um, and the other called Slippery Slope, and you look specifically at the big tech companies. Now, many of us wouldn't have necessarily thought that they are involved in this, but they are. Could you you explain a bit about that? Yeah, with um, weapons becoming more autonomous, um, there's... A big side of it is, is related to specifically the sort of technologies, uh, tech companies such as Google, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, what, what they develop. And we've seen over the past couple of years that more and more the sort of technologies of these companies get integrated into military equipment. Uh, for example, uh, Microsoft's HoloLens um, originally uh, invented and made for, for gamers, for, for the health industry, was um, sold or, or uh, the Pentagon had contracted Microsoft to use that same uh, augmented reality uh, HoloLens to increase, as they said, the lethality of its soldiers. And that sparked a big discussion within uh, Microsoft among its workers, like, this is not why we thought we were working at Microsoft and we, we don't like this. And, and it, it created a big discussion within Microsoft for the report. We, we were in touch with the research director of, of Microsoft and they said, yes, we're developing a policy on this, on, on where we want to draw the line, on what we think is acceptable as a company to, to work on, on military technology. Um, but it's not out there yet, so we can't officially comment on, on, on your report. But they're working on it, and it's highly controversial. But they also see uh, the potential big money that it's involved. But on the other hand, as Google, for example, has seen, there's also uh, the, the huge risk of public backlash. Reputational yeah, risk. Yeah, reputational risk. But on the one hand, we're talking about states. On the other hand, we're talking about companies. Can I make this Uh, something, a killer robot in my garage? And how are you going to stop me or some group making this without a form of control? Well, it was the roboticists and artificial intelligence experts and scientists who came to Human Rights Watch uh, and other groups uh, and said, we've been watching your work against landmines, against cluster munitions. We're concerned that there are no specific rules for fully autonomous weapons, uh, and we can see that they are going to be developed Uh, And it's really, we could also do that ourselves if we wanted to. We could build a fully autonomous weapon and we feel like it's just our ethics that's holding us back at the moment, the knowledge that that is wrong. Uh, and, And so they wanted to see specific rules that would be laid down internationally. Including non-state actors, including individuals, that's where it gets complicated for me. Well, any international treaty, at least the humanitarian disarmament ones that I've been involved in, once you sign it, that's only the beginning of the process of dealing with those weapons. They have to legislate in order to enforce the treaties, and that's one way in which you can deal with the non-state actors. Just for clarification, um, because... We know that drones have been used in Pakistan, they've been used in Afghanistan, they are, they are a, kind of a, a weapon of choice often for, for the US um, to take out people they think are terrorists. But these are not things that you're objecting to. As far as I know, there is still some element, maybe increasingly small, but some element of human control. Yes, exactly. Uh, there is, you know, autonomous drones can be can be flown autonomously. You know, some can take off, can land autonomously. But ultimately, there's still a human operator who's responsible for determining if if a target is legitimate, if it is legal, and then for pressing the fire button. And that's the part that we don't want to cross. That's the moral line that we do not want to do. We do not want to outsource killing to machines. 
in warfare, but also policing, law enforcement, crowd control, border enforcement. There are many different scenarios in which fully autonomous weapons may end up being used. Are we sure that border hasn't been crossed yet, Frank? I'm, I'm actually, what, what I thought was, was really a big thing when, when two months ago that attack in Saudi Arabia that attacked uh, oil installations nearly sparked off uh, a huge conflict between two of the, the major powers in the region, Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. And, and, and it fortunately didn't happen. Uh, and, and still until today, nobody's 100% sure whether it was launched by Houthi militants in, in Yemen or whether it was state-controlled, uh, flown and directed from, from Iran. And still we're talking about probably completely remotely controlled drones but you see already that there it becomes harder and harder to identify who, who has done it. And that also may risk conflict um, much more. But we're not only talking about drones. In your report, you talk about land weapons, you talk about sea weapons. So it's more than just airplanes flying. Yeah, I think most significant developments so far we've seen in the air with because we've had drones being used already so much so most of the developments have have uh, gone from there but but very recently there was a military journalist that was visiting one of the largest arms fairs in the world in london in uh, in september dsei and she said the really big thing here on the on the the floor in this arms fair are ground robots i come to these arms fairs uh, regularly this is the first time that it's the dominant uh, issue so from the experience that we have with drones in the air, with the experience that we're also developing in the civilian sector with self-driving cars, of course. Uh, companies try to make a next step there and, and arm ground robots. And, um, yeah, I think we, we will see similar sort of developments uh, in, in, in that sector as well. But if, if at the end of the day it's just uh, ground robots, air robots, robots killing each other... Isn't that better or is that a stupid question? Well, is it? I mean, I work for Human Rights Watch and I support our research and there's no such thing as a clean battlefield. There are always going to be civilians in the area. And you look at warfare today, most of it is fought in towns and in cities. And imagine sending in uh, an autonomous uh, machine that is weaponized uh, and programming it to go out and attack and to kill uh, in such a cluttered environment, as the technologists like to say. Uh, you know, self-driving cars... And at the moment are operating in quite strict parameters and you have so much unpredictability in warfare. It moves, it can move fast as well. There are so many unknowns. So trying to program into a machine the laws of war or ethics is a really major task right now and it's not possible and it may not be possible for decades to come. But in the meantime, the stupid AI and the emerging tech is already being incorporated into weapon systems. Uh, how successful have we been in history in getting rid of certain weapons? You think about atomic weapons, you think about chemical weapons. We can have these treaties, but how effective have they been? It seems to me the technology is slightly ahead of the legal aspects. I'd rather live in a, a rules-based uh, world rather than one with uh, no rules. And um, I would say that the Landmine Treaty has been extremely successful. 122 countries signed up to the ban on landmines in 1997. Now 164 are part of the agreement. But we also see China, Russia, the United States pretty much abiding by the provisions of that convention. We do not see the mass-produced factory made by the millions uh, of landmines being exported and transferred around the world anymore because they have been prohibited. So even if you do not sign up, the stigma that you create is what uh, I think those states are, are looking at. Um, but there's, of course, issues with non-state armed groups. Uh, this is a difficult thing, but I'd rather have a framework, a rules, rules in place than, than nothing. And we don't have any framework for this at all. Well, so you know, the one thing that the governments can agree on is that the law applies to any <laughs> weapon system. And we're like, that's a no-brainer, you know. But this <laughs> is, of course the law applies. But, you know, the, these weapon systems are going to violate the laws of war. The Accountability. That's what I meant to, to put on our list of things we should discuss. You know, if a robot goes out and kills 500 civilians who are doing nothing... It's a war crime. Who do you prosecute? And especially if the 
uh, if the weapon is not under human control. So you can, how do you punish a robot? Well, you could try and prosecute the programmer, but that's not really going to work. You could try and hold the manufacturer accountable, uh, but we've also looked at this uh, from a legal perspective, and it's extremely challenging. Do you hold the commander responsible who, who uh, once initiated or activated the weapon system? Uh, there's what we call an accountability gap when it comes to killer robots. Do you actually know who the producer is or who's been the developer or who's been... Uh, the, the commander. So um, that makes it probably even more. And, and that's why we've also raised that question that that is a, bi a big issue, uh, accountability. If it's outside of human control, we use this phrase in corporate social responsibility, there's no soul to damn, no body to kick. So doesn't that open up a whole problem of evaluation and accountability responsibility? The strange thing actually is that, um, and, and I find it hard to understand that most states in the room agree that human control is, is necessary and, and that it's a bad thing that we would have fully autonomous weapons. And still, a handful of states especially, and they happen to be the technologically most advanced military industrial states, they, they block this development because they are afraid to uh, lose their leading role. The US and China, we've seen so many... Um, Articles over over the past year where where there's this rivalry being is used. it an arms race between them? There, both countries are investing huge amounts of money in in civilian AI, but also in in military a, a, applied AI. They are investing lots and lots of money. Look at, at DARPA historically, actually as well has been the 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 biggest contributor to to AI uh, progress in 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 the U.S. and not only for military applications, also for human uh, for for um, civilian applications. But that has as a huge effect on, on the military Dual applications. Use, yeah. yeah. How much does it cost to build a robot drone? In, in, in our report, Slippery Slope, um, we, we quote a company, um, an Australian company called Defentex, uh, which actually uh, mentions that making use of civilian components, they, they want to uh, lower the price of their product, and their aim is to bring it down under 500 US dollars. And so that, that's another example where we see a big fear of how, by lowering the price, this sort of equipment becomes available for an even wider public, not only military, but also non-state actors or uh, lone individuals who may use it for their own purposes. Or, or build one? I mean, is it that complicated to build? You could build a stupid uh, autonomous weapon system right now using basic sensors, but it would not... Um abide by the laws of war or, or it would be illegal to use. But yes, you certainly could have a go at it. It strikes me that you and your colleagues have been raising this subject here at the UN for many years now, years in which the price of things like my laptop and mobile phone that are in front of me have reduced substantially but become infinitely more sophisticated. Um, so this technology will be going the same way. And yet it does seem, as with other discussions we've seen in the UN disarmament process, that no progress on control is, is being made at all. Do, is the UN the right place to discuss this? Well, is it, is, are the governments discussing it in the right way? At the moment, they're in a consensus-based forum, so everybody has to agree in order to recommend what to do. And there are a couple of powerful countries, uh, as, as, as you said, that are, are blocking progress there. But the diplomats are well aware that the technology is bounding ahead and that their, their proceedings, their discussions are glacial. Uh, they're talking right now about whether to meet for two or three weeks next year. And I'm like, what are you going to do for the other 50 weeks of the year? They're incredibly slow. So, yes, I think it is time to leave the United Nations and to take a new path. You Can you name and shame companies about this? Is that successful? Um Depends this is big business. Yeah. This is big business. Depends. I think in, in, in the tech sector, yes, because they, they, uh, they have a large consumer base that uh, they're dependent of. Um, for the arms companies, it's maybe a little bit more difficult, but um, within PACs, we've 
done a lot of work over the past 10 years engaging, for example, the financial sector and, and how they invest their money. And we've been very successful in uh, dissuading financial institutions in, in putting money into nuclear weapons uh, producing companies. And uh, we see the same interest from these financial institutions who have developed policies on these issues, uh, co corporate social responsibility policies, that they want to know from us that, hey, how, how do you look at this development in, in the area of autonomous weapons and how do you um, define companies that are working in this area? So, uh, and, and we're talking with them and they're very interested. Do any of these companies also come to the CCW and lobby or are they keeping a low profile? I mean, uh, some of them have accepted invitations to come here. Google DeepMind uh, has come and presented many various artificial intelligence experts and roboticists. Uh, the campaign uh, has brought uh, technology workers who, from some companies, including tech workers who've quit their jobs, uh, to, to the UN to engage with the governments. But we don't really have them sitting at the back of the room with the Google nameplate. We don't really have the Lockheed Martin sitting at the back of the room with the nameplate. They know that it's the government's responsibility to regulate uh, and that they will do what the governments decide. Do the companies have a problem distinguishing what we call dual use? In other words, they can say we're doing something for civilian use, but then someone can buy that and use it for a killer robot. The same kind of technology just tweaked a little bit. Um, that, that could be possible, but I mean that... Is... Google Map, for example, is that a dual use? Um, no, not in, in my definition, at least, because it's it's something that's just openly available and it isn't developed with a specific military purpose in mind. Yes, you can use it for military purposes, but you can also use a, a knife for military purposes or, or for um, um, aggressive purposes, and that doesn't make it a dual use good per se. Uh, but Google certainly got in a lot of PR trouble last year when it was revealed that it was working on a Department of Defense contract called Project Maven. And the, they were tasking the computer programmers and the other experts inside Google uh, with, with sifting, helping to sift through thousands of hours of footage shot by surveillance drones over various countries to try and determine uh, if they could uh, pick out objects and I wrote a letter saying, how can you, you know, assure us that the search for objects isn't going to turn into one a search for targets uh, to use lethal action against? Is there a sense, though, or do you sense that the companies are wanting some guidelines from states? I think it depends a bit. I think some companies like to hide, be, like to hide behind uh, the state, that they want the state to develop uh, those guidelines or prohibitions or whatever. Um, but, I mean, for, for the research we did, we also were in touch with companies who got back to us and say, no, we, we have our own responsibility and we make sure that uh, there is always a human in control over this, this system. And we, we've developed a policy for it. And um, we actually also demanded from our customers that uh, they will not use the type of technology we develop for um, purposes with no human control. So... With some companies, there's a clear awareness, and, and we hope to, that uh, with the, the sort of uh, advocacy we do, more and more companies will develop policies in that direction. We'll also have um, discussions within the company about uh, the, the type of new developments they're working on, and um, we hope that that would contribute to more of awareness within uh, the, the private sector. We are, as ever, almost out of time. Um, I'd like to maybe get just a closing comment from each of you, from you as well, Danny, based on what we've been talking about, based on your research, Mary and Frank. Um, where do you want the UN to be on this next year? But where do you also fear we're going to be in 10 years on this subject? Mary, I'll start with you. I mean, the United Nations is the place that we come to, to for the governments to meet. It's, it's, the, it's the home that we come to. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that one year ago, the United Nations Secretary General 
He called for a ban on fully autonomous weapons. He called such weapons morally repugnant and politically unacceptable and basically offered the services of the UN to negotiate international law on this. So the United Nations is firmly behind the call for regulation, uh, but the consensus-based forum is what is the struggle here. Therefore, it's more than likely that there will be an outside process, either launched through the United Nations in New York uh, or by a bold political leader, a foreign minister, uh, and a small group of states, which will then grow into a big process and create the treaty. Frank? I'm very much afraid that if we don't have a treaty within 10 years, we will be too late, that within 10 years, looking at how developments technologically have gone and, and examples that we see, um, technology is progressing at a much faster pace than dem diplomacy is doing. And if they don't have a treaty within 10 years time, I, I fear the worst. What do you think, Danny? Is well, I mean, I, I, I'm, all, I'm all in favor of norms uh, and I'm in favor of treaties and laws. But I also think the private sector has different kinds of motivations. And I always worry about not only non-state actors as groups, but also individuals. And, and the question of how you control individuals, you can have treaties, but individuals are sitting there thinking that this is going to be something I can use. And if it's that simple to make, that will be extraordinarily difficult to control. Well, that brings us to the end of Inside Geneva for this week. Thank you all for listening. A very tricky, tricky subject, Mon, I'm sure we will return to in the months to come. Mary Wareham, Frank Slipers, Daniel Warner, thanks very much for joining us. That was Imogen Fox reporting. For more stories on the issues being discussed in international Geneva, visit us at swissinfo.ch. We produce this podcast every few weeks, so check back soon or follow us on Twitter or Facebook to hear about the next one. Better yet, subscribe on a platform like Apple Podcasts to be sure you don't miss an episode. Thanks for listening, and thank you to studio technician Donnie Wheeler. Signing off for all of us here, I'm Susan Masika. Do you want to polish your knowledge about Swiss elections, referendums and political parties, while at the same time learning more about the quirks of the political system in Switzerland? If that's the case, our newsletter course is just what you need. Each week for a month, we'll send you a free instalment explaining the most important details of how Swiss democracy works. Our course teaches you who's eligible to vote in Switzerland, what the different parties stand for, how election and popular vote results are implemented, and what distinguishes Swiss democracy from other political systems. Our crash course is interactive, like democracy itself. Your questions will be answered on an FAQ page, and you can debate with other users and share your inputs and opinions. We will also provide links to multimedia articles and videos to help you better understand the Swiss democratic system. Please join us and sign up for the free Democracy Crash Course newsletter at www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy. That's www.swissinfo.ch slash democracy.